so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and give us a whiteboard and uh, I have the chat up in case anybody has a question or needs to say anything. And um, <clears throat> okay, that should be good. So where did we end off last time? Well, So we started out really broadly, um, and I just want to make sure um, everybody can hear me. Thumbs up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So, so um, we started out really broadly with this idea that economics is the scientific study of resource allocation mechanisms, and then we said, well. You know, there are a lot of different mechanisms, but the mechanism we want to focus on is the market. And then um, we drilled down and we said our, our starting point is this idea we call the first fundamental welfare theorem. And in its simplest um, description, it, it, it just says that competitive markets are efficient. And um, that's a good preliminary statement. So I'll just say, um, so we label this correctly, this is our preliminary um, statement of the first fundamental welfare theorem. And so, um, this will, you know, uh, sustain us through the entire class. And again, if you guys sort of like wondered, <laughs> like, well, gosh, the whole class is about one theorem. It kind of tells you um, how important it is, right? And and uh, so when we drilled down on this, um, we said, really, what it's telling us is we have these these two jobs as economists. One is to describe the equilibrium. And just so you guys know, we, we normally, because equilibrium is a long word, we'll abbreviate it this way. And the second is to evaluate or measure the welfare consequences of the equilibrium. And um, we were careful to say, well, we want to make sure that, that we measure um, um, welfare properly. And um, so our, our other observation is that um, we, or economics, right, um, uses the concept of net social benefit to measure welfare. And it's just important because, again, you know, in our discipline, we, like other disciplines, we have jargon, we have special ways that we use language. And, you know, our definition of welfare isn't necessarily perfectly matching up with what the general notions of welfare are that are out there. Um, so we want to be careful um, and, and, and make sure that we know what we're talking about. So um, from there, right, we kind of said, okay, we have to drill down on both of these concepts. And, and um, so the first one were the, you know, there are various equilibrium concepts. And, 
And we'll talk about all of those equilibrium concepts as we move through the course. And, you know, there isn't only competitive equilibrium. Um, there are, you know, other types of equilibrium too. Um, and so we made a quick list. We said, well, you know, we have all these different monopoly, uh, oligopoly equilibria. We have Corno, Bertrand, Stackelberg, to name a few. And uh, then we have a competitive equilibrium. We have a monopoly equilibrium. But I'll, I'll have you guys note that um, the first fundamental welfare theorem only mentions competitive equilibrium, right? And so that also kind of gives you this idea that, well, competition has some special um, properties or, or um, virtues within economics that, you know, economists have tied the discipline to. So competition is really special. And so that being the case, um, we normally end up giving definitions of, you know, what is a competitive market. And, and there are lots of ways to characterize um, a competitive market. You know, one aspect is that, um, you know, competitive markets are characterized by voluntary trade, right? So, and, and a lot of times people use, you know, the term free trade and that's fine. Um, but it's important that you understand that in this context, voluntary is really a better word because it, it, it immediately points out that there's no coercion happening. And so coercion is, you know, under some form of threat or duress, right, or violence. You know, I mean, we know that, that trade occurs when one person steals something from someone else, <laughs> but that's not voluntary, right? So, um, you know, that's a coercive trade. And, and so in competition, you know, we don't, we don't have coercive trading going on. And you might think that's kind of like a trivial thing to talk about, but um, I'll, I'll point out um, just as an aside that a lot of the objections that people have raised, you know, in, in the last, you know, 20, 30 years to international trading relationships is that a lot of times they seem that like they involve some level of coercion, right? So that the countries or people within the countries feel like they are forced to participate in the trade and they don't really want to, but they don't have um, good alternatives. So, um, you know, if you, if you um, categorize all trading immediately as being voluntary, if you don't look a little bit deeper into the nature of the trading relationship to, to see that um, it, it is voluntary, then, then that's just something that's missing from the analysis. And if the analysis isn't done right, um, you know, the math will lead you in the wrong direction. You know, math is about inputs and outputs. And, um, you know, uh, there's a famous phrase that, that people have used to describe when you do computations with the wrong inputs, it's garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't, if you, don't you know, look at the details, um, then you're liable to, to, to make mistakes. So that's just, you know, a, a word of warning. But um, the other thing I want to talk about is that, it, you know, uh, uh, again, uh, a preliminary way description of, or describing, you know, a description uh, of competitive markets 
and a lot of um, economics textbooks do this, is they say, uh, well, there are many buyers and sellers. And that's not really good enough for our purposes. Um, we want to be more specific. And in fact, the first fun fundamental welfare theorem is uh, more specific too um, when it's stated more precisely than what we've done in our preliminary version. And, and um, the, the conditions of uh, competition And I also will, will um, put a few adjectives in here. Sometimes people talk about pure or perfect competition. Really, what it boils down to is what we were talking about before. Um, you know, how closely do the conditions of competition match up with the reality that we're seeing in a market and in the market that we want to describe, even if we're describing it um, theoretically. So, um, you know, if, if, if we're not careful, we can describe something that's um, close to competition and that might be useful um, because we're not committing the garbage in garbage out error but um, we might know that we're describing something that's sufficiently close uh, to competition that we're not overly concerned in the, the, the deviations between our ideal setting and, and the one that we're trying to, to capture in our economic model. Um, but um, we have uh, three conditions that we require. And the first one I'll state simply is no market power. And I'll also tell you guys that this is sometimes called no monopoly power. Now, you might wonder, and I think that's fine, you know, what exactly is monopoly power? Well, clearly a monopolist has monopoly power. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be a monopolist, right? But it's the ability to set price in a way that um, creates an advantage. And I'm talking generally here, but, you know, for... For sellers, it means profit. Buyers can have um, market power too. And in that context, we call it monopsony power. But um, um, they can gain an advantage by extracting a lower price than they would otherwise get if they're um, the buyer. And if it's the seller and it's monopolist, they can, they can, can do something to um, strategically increase the price. So I say the ability to, to set price in a way that creates um, an advantage for one of the trading partners. So uh, I, E, buyer or seller. Okay. So um, just to give you guys a, a really, really um, quick example, um, because I think monopoly power is, is probably clear enough. A lot of people say that Walmart has uh, um, some form of monopoly power within um, retail sales because they're such a big enterprise. And I'm not gonna argue that one way or the other, uh, but I think it's easy to understand. They have this really big dominant position in uh, retail trade. But I, I can tell you that I have seen evidence 
that at the wholesale level that Walmart has monopsony power against uh, product manufacturers. So if you guys um, you know, think about retail trade, then you, the retail trade is where the seller, in this case Walmart, is, is selling directly to the consumer, which is me or you. But I would say all, but I don't know for sure that it's all. Um, but, but most of the things that Walmart sells, Walmart doesn't manufacture. So at the wholesale level, um, Walmart's a buyer and, and they buy the products that they sell from product manufacturers and distributors. Um, and, and so there's a lot of actual stuff online. And if this was a, a course in industrial organization, which is something you guys might take a little bit later, um, Dr. Kerr teaches that. And I know a lot of people enjoy the course. It's a good course. Um, but, you know, you, you could do in, in that class uh, a review of some of these videos, some of them are an hour long, that document pretty well how um, Walmart um, has used their position within um, the retail trade business at the wholesale level to extract price reductions from um, product manufacturers to the point that they've even put some product manufacturers out of business because um, what happens is if you don't meet Walmart's demand and they don't take you on as uh, a trading partner at the wholesale level, then your decline in sales is so dramatic that a lot of times it forces companies into bankruptcy because um, they're just missing that huge market. And a lot of product manufacturers know this and they try um, their best to meet, meet Walmart's demands. But in many cases, Walmart's asking them to get such a small um, markup over their cost of production that, that they really can't meet Walmart's demands. And so in either case, right, um, if they meet Walmart's demands, then they're, you know, suffering um, because they're having a difficult time um, manufacturing for the price they're selling to Walmart, or they don't sell to Walmart. And in that case, um, they don't have enough um, volume of their product um, to, to keep their costs low. So anyway, yeah, they're, 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 they're um, well-documented cases of um, Walmart being able to use their position to extract these lower prices. So whenever one of the parties has the ability to manipulate the price of trade, um, then um, there's market power. And even if there are lots of buyers and sellers and certain people have market power and others don't, uh, we don't have a competitive equilibrium. And um, that's important. Um, you know, as a, as a first way of characterizing what's going on. Okay, so um, we'll continue. Other conditions of competition. So, um, and there's actually one thing that I wanted to um, point out to you guys here. And a lot of times we have a shorthand way of saying that there's no market power um, that's related to, to the discussion we we're just having. And that is that if there's no market power, then we say that the market participants are um, price takers. And that just means they look at the market, they see the price at which things are trading, and they decide to trade or not to trade at that price. They, they don't um, entertain strategies of manipulating the price in any way. Um, uh, so taking the price as given by the market and then 
deciding to trade or not at the market. And I'm going to use another word here, which is um, common, which is the prevailing price. And I actually want to kind of stop there for a minute because I think it's an interesting word. And I want to ask you guys, um, what do you guys think prevailing price is about? What is, what, wh why is that an interesting word for us? And if you'd like to chat about it, um, just put VOL in the chat and, um, and let's talk for a minute. So I'm looking for balls. <laughs> So I have no vols. Oh, okay. Varun. Oh, well, actually, I think, okay, well, I'll do Varun because I saw you you, you first, but I see that Z, Z1. So we may get to you, Z1, in a minute. Um, but Varun, are you there? You got your mic? Oh, no, Mike. I need a mic. How about you, Ziwan? Ziwan Jiang. Do you have a Hi. Mic? Hi. Um, hi. Um, is it means like the average average price of the market, you know, during certain period? So did you say average price? Yes. Like the market price? Or? Well, well, see, yes. Yeah, so the market price can change, right? It can be up and down. So prevailing price doesn't mean average, but it's a good, it's a good idea. It's a good idea, um, and um, but I'll, I'll maybe I'll come back to you in a minute. Let's see what Derek has to say. Do you have a, a mic, Derek? Yeah, I got one. So, what do you think it's about? Um, so prevailing price. I think it's does it have something to do with the price, kind of at the point of equilibrium, kind of where the the market clears. Yeah, yeah, and market clearing price is a fine synonym, but we use this word prevailing. Okay, and so that's what I wanted to, and my, we use market clearing too, but a lot of times you'll read the prevailing price and, and um, is any, anybody else want to take a stab at it um, to chat? Okay, so um, what about you, Hannah? Do you have an idea? Um, I was thinking maybe like the top price that people will pay. Oh, much. so maybe. so like like their maximum willingness to pay that kind of thing. Yeah, like they want to pay less, but they will pay that because it's already set at that. I okay. Guess, like maybe all like all of the costs of things around that same thing are kind of priced the same. Uh, okay. but it seems <laughs> well it's not it's not their maximum price that's for sure it is the market clearing price or it is the market equilibrium price but we use this word prevailing price i take one more person to try to explain how that language became common in in um our discipline and um so um, so I'm looking for somebody with a, with a, a mic and how about Sarah? Are, are, oh, and then we'll come back to you, Sonica. What's this? Sarah, Sarah and Grani on Grainy. Are you there, Sarah? Okay, I think maybe maybe Sarah's AFK. So um, Alexander, you volunteered, and then we'll do Sonica too. But Alexander, go ahead. Uh, 
Uh, oh, I'm waiting. Alexander, do you have your mic? Hello? Yeah, Alexander, go ahead. Hi, sorry about that. Um, I would guess it's something along the lines of the, the price for like a, a period of time, like a day or a week, um, the, the current price that the market is at. Oh, oh, oh okay, okay. So you're, you're, so if you think market price or, or the market clearing price, and we could talk about what market clearing means a little bit more, but, but those are both synonyms. But if you're thinking about something, uh, some other price than that, then you're wrong. It's just a different word. And, and, um, and so that's why the word's interest. <laughs> but so let, 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 let's try Sonica for a minute and, and then I'll, I'll give you guys a hint. And um, what did you come up with Sonica? So like, I vaguely remember it as something where like, there's no real tendency for the price to change at that market price. Yeah, that's equilibrium, right? Is, is, is a tendency for the price to stay at that level. That's right. Um, um, but I'm talking about this word prevailing, like what is that about? So this will be, this is my hint, okay? And the first person that, that types vol, I'll take a comment from, okay? So when you prevail, think about that. Okay. Think UFC fighting, you know, think, you know, 300 gladiator. I prevail. Right. What is that? Right. So now do you guys think that you can put a little bit more meat on the metaphorical bone because it is a metaphor um, that that's coming into the, the language that, that we're using. Um, so anybody? Okay, so who, oh, I think Alexander, well, yeah, yeah, I think it's Alexander again, or was it Sonica? Whoever, I can't really tell because the chat thing's like, uh, no, oh, my dog's barking. <laughs> Okay. You can go for it, Sonica. Sonica, okay. I'm fine with either, but uh, do you have any ideas, Alex? <laughs> you guys don't watch enough gladiator movies. I mean, the <laughs> one thing that comes to mind with prevail is like just like when I think of prevalent and prevail, it's more of like something that's just bound to happen. Like that's that's a price that's going to happen regardless or something like that. Well, uh, okay. So if one team prevails over another, what am I talking about? Or if one, you know, soldier prevails on the battlefield, they are the, what's another word for that? Winners? Yeah, they're the winners. They, you know, they won in the competition, right? And so, so that's really what they're talking about. Again, it's this metaphor of competition um, that's all throughout, you know, our discipline. And just to be kind of clear about this, because you'll see this a lot in the language, you know, a lot of the people that um, first, and we're talking about Adam Smith, um, they were a little bit after Adam Smith. So in the 1800s, they were um, contemporaries of meaning that they were around the same time that Darwin was, right? And Darwin was talking about, um, you know, evolutionary pressure, selection, fitness, competition between different species and members of the same species. So, um, you know, that's the way that, that our discipline thinks about markets and, you know, the outcomes that, that happen. Um, or at least, you know, the language, I would say that, that, you know, it's embedded in the language, this ideal, this idea that, well, there are a bunch of different potential prices that could be out there, right? And which one actually emerges from the competition, that's like, you know, the winner, the winning price, it's the one that prevails in the market. So it's the one that we see in equilibrium. Anyway, I, I wanted to make sure we spent a minute on it or maybe more than a minute just because 
um, you guys are going to see it in a lot of different contexts, maybe in questions, even that I that I write in this in this class or in other textbooks. But it's just another word for the equilibrium price, but it embeds this 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 idea that you know it's not just consumers and producers that are competing for the good in a competitive market. You know, sellers competing against other sellers and buyers competing against other buyers to get the good and to sell the good. And then, you know, like the, you know, what price is, it's going to be sold for. There's like a competition between the different potential prices that could happen in the market. But um, eventually we get a, a winner and that's our prevailing price. Okay. Anybody have any questions about that? Um, okay. Maybe not. So we'll move on. So, um, but I think it's pretty interesting and, and informative to, um, you know, meditate a little bit on, um, you know, the thought processes that underline the, uh, underlie the theories, um, that are described in our discipline because, um, it kind of gives us this, this, this richer, um, um, you know, landscape of, you know, the way in which the, the, the theory came to be. So other aspects of competition. Um, the first or the second one is going to be no externalities. And um, remember that, that um, when we're talking about externalities, and we're talking about trade, that um, trade occurs between two parties. And sometimes you could call them the two primary parties to trade are the buyer and the seller. Um, they're primary parties in the sense that for a trade to occur, you don't need anybody else, right? You got a buyer, you got a seller, but inevitably there are third parties, right? So there are third parties and sometimes the third parties And third parties just mean other parties, right? If you've got two primary parties, you got party one and party two, and then you have this other group. So I could just put in parentheses here, other parties. Um, and I'll say to the trade. And if we want to be a little bit more um, abstract, sometimes we'll say parties to the transaction. And, and a, a lot of times, um, you know, there's some very, very good theory and, um, it, it, you know, clear exposition on what's going on in a particular economic relationship when they just talk about um, trade as transactions. You know, I'm transacting between party one and party two to trade this good. Sometimes that's a clearer way to think about it. Um, so other parties to, to the trade or transaction. And um, so the, you know, parties you might imagine are, you know, maybe brokers, um, dealers, the government, some regulator, right? And then I'll also put here, um, other members of society generally um, whose interests are not represented by 
the buyer or seller. And I, I say it this way um, because this is a, a good general description of um, why other people might be interested um, in what's happening in a particular trading relationship. And usually it's because they're either going to benefit from it. And this is why I mentioned all these other ones in your book and in most books, they're not mentioned, but if you, but if you think about um, like buying and selling a home and a realtor um, that's helping to facilitate the transaction, or maybe there are two realtors, one representing the buyer, one re representing the seller or lawyers or somebody like that. Um, you know, they have an interest in the transaction because they're going to receive a benefit from it, right? Um, if it goes through, they get a commission, you know, percentage of the sale, that type of thing. That's really easy to, to, to think about. Um, but there are a lot of instances in which, you know, companies and or buyers and sellers are transacting and there's a real interest um, of a, another party that's not represented in that trade um, meaning that there's a potential cost or a benefit that's going to fall on that third party so um, you know the, the most concrete example the one that's most often given is when we're talking about the trade in industrial products like gasoline steel coal um, fertilizer and um, you know industrial large-scale production in crops or mining and so what you guys might have figured out is that generally those types of activities involve pollutants pollution right and and normally the impacts of those pollutions that type of pollution if it's unregulated are significant and this is not a course on um, environmental regulation or the history of environmental regulation or the history of pollution. But if you guys haven't taken any um, sort of those courses, there's a famous book um, written by a lady in the 1960s, Rachel Carson, um, called Silent Spring. And it's about how um, pesticides had at that time been so widely used in agriculture that they'd killed um, you know tons of insects and fish and things like that and and I don't know if you guys remember when I was growing up a lot of people were talking about DDT and and how many birds had been killed because it turns out you know the the birds eat the insects the insects had the the DDT in them and and because of that, the the birds had um, defects in in their ability to produce viable eggs, and so there's just like lots of things going on. But you know, even if you you don't think about um, you know those types of you know impacts on on you know fish and wildlife. A lot of times, um, and I don't know if you guys have, have seen the movie, there's a Julia Roberts movie from 20, 25 years ago um, and uh, called Aaron Brockovich. And it's about um, some pollution that was produced in um, oil refining that, that caused this big cancer cluster um, because of this, this um, you know, side chemical called hexavalent chromium that ended up in the, the drinking water, you know, accidentally. Um, but, you know, one of the things is when you're doing this large scale industrial pollution and you're trying to minimize your costs, then it's almost inevitable there are going to be some accidents um, if, you know, it's not regulated in, in, in the right way. So, so the point is that obviously cancer means you're, you know, 
going to die and probably get too sick to work and have all these other costs. But you don't have to be somebody that either buys or sells the product that generates this third party effect. And the reason why I pointed out real estate brokers is I wanted you guys to, to understand that there are both um, positive, positive and um, negative externalities. Um, meaning uh, costs, well, the positive is the benefits or costs to third parties from a transaction. I'll give you guys one other um, quick example, which is, you know, commonly discussed, which is secondhand cigarette smoke, right? You guys probably know their health effects, and I don't know if you guys just find it annoying uh, if you don't smoke, being exposed to cigarette smoke. But, you know, it can cause people to have asthma attacks and damage their health if they're exposed to it a lot. In fact, before they, they banned uh, smoking in restaurants, there was a higher incident of lung cancer and things like related problems, lung problems, um, for waiters and waitresses that served customers in, on a regular basis in smoky restaurants. Now, the point is that you've got the two primary parties, which are the cigarette buyer, the smoker, and the cigarette seller, the tobacco company, right? Um, and they're just making a trade. And they're making the trade based on their assessment of the costs and the benefits of you know trading the good. Um, and that's fine, but um, the market's not competitive if you have those types of third-party effects. You have to um, look more closely. And it may share some aspects of competition, but in the strictest sense of it, if we have externalities, the equilibrium that emerges um, isn't, isn't going to have all of the properties. It's not going to be efficient. And there are going to be other other um, concerns that we have. So, so first to be talking about um, competition properly, we have to make sure we're talking about a situation in which there are no externalities. And the third and and last one is that um, there is symmetric, and sometimes people say um, perfect. Though I think that's misleading, it's 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 stronger, right? Perfect information, and um, so there are two different ways of stating the assumption. But the point is that um, even if we have no market power, no externalities, we can still end up with an equilibrium as a result of voluntary trade. And so you might you might um, you know distinguish uh, these ideas by saying, well, you can have a voluntary trading equilibrium that's not necessarily um, competitive in the way that we want to use the word competition. So um, people can voluntarily trade, and if they have um, asymmetric information or, or um, and that's really the type of imperfection information we're concerned about um, that would cause the resulting equilibrium to no longer be efficient. Okay, so, so um, what do we mean by symmetric information? Well, there, there are really two levels um, of ways of thinking about it. One is, what I would just call no regrets, okay? And and um, what I mean by that is that, you know, I could buy a product and it could turn out to be defective 
and I could say, ah, you know, like, I wish I could take that back. But the point is, as long as I know at the very beginning when I purchased it, and I, I have to ask you guys this um, question, so we'll 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 spend just a minute on this, um, and I'll take if anybody wants to volunteer, they can type fall. So. Um, when you go and you buy something, a lot of times this happens at Target and other places. You buy something that's electronic. Um, I remember a short time ago, I went down um, with with my daughter, um, who's my 13 year old daughter. One of our, um, you know, daddy daughter activities is we play Call of Duty Black Ops 4 <laughs> together, and we wore out one of our controllers and so we went down to GameStop and we bought a new PS4 controller and I purchased the controller and the, the, the person helping me at the uh, cashier there said, hey, so, you know, um, for 20 bucks, you know, we can protect this. So if anything happens to it, um, you know, you can come back in and just get a new one. And I said, you know, hey, I live dangerously and I turned it down. And and so you guys know what I'm talking about. Anybody else have this happen? They go in and they purchase stuff. And, and um, that's what I want to talk about. Do I have a volunteer? You guys have purchased anything? Uh, iPhone or uh, keyboard or <laughs> PlayStation? Oh, did I get Justin? Did you volunteer, Justin? You have your mic. Um, oh, that was for the previous, uh, previous one. With the, you ever, uh, you ever, do you ever buy anything and and have them offer you insurance on it? Oh uh, yeah, a, a lot, a lot of stuff. Uh, especially for uh, building my computer, a lot of, a lot of companies uh, offer to have warranty on them. Yeah, and so do you? Do you get the warranty or not? Never. Never. Me neither. And and and, but is it because you think the thing can't break? Uh, no. It's it's mainly more for me knowing that I can keep it safe. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So 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 in 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 my case, I know a, a couple things. One is. That, yeah, there's some chance there's a manufactured defect and it's gonna it, it's gonna break. But you know, for most things, it's covered for a year anyway, just automatically. But you might have to deal with the manufacturer. You can't necessarily take it straight back to the retailer. Retailer will only normally deal with it for 30 days. But you have this like limited like window under current law that that you know you can you can um, if it's a tragic situation, it's a big lemon. You can normally take care of it as long as um, you do it you know relatively quickly. And, and they're just normally talking about the time period after that. But, you know, if you've ever, if you've ever thought about it, and, and the second thing that I know is economists work for these big companies, and they set the rates on the, the policies, so it creates a profit opportunity for them. So they look across their product, and they see the rate of failure, and then they decide how much to offer the insurance for so that based on the probability of failure and the premium that they're charging that they'll make money at the end of the day right so i might be really unlucky and and it might be the case that actually the insurance benefits me but on average the insurance benefits the manufacturer so for me i just assume that I'm going to have the average probability of failure and I just, you know, will accept the loss if it's going to come my way. And, but the important thing that I wanted to point out, and I think you made a, a good, you know, a, a point on this too, which was that it's not like I don't think the thing can't break. It's just that I know I'm not going to be ridiculous with it. I'm going to take care of it. And, you know, if there happens to be some weird defect in it, well, then, you know, I'm willing to accept that loss. And that's really what no regrets is about. It's not being perfectly certain of what's going to happen in the future. It's just having a good assessment of the probability 
that the product is going to um, be reliable or be unreliable. And, and, and the other thing that's important, so this, this like kind of like no regrets, I'm not surprised if the thing fails just because I knew there was some chance and it's not happening all the time, my probability estimates aren't way off. And the other thing is that <clears throat> um, the buyer's estimate of failure should be equal to the seller's estimate. So there's this um, agreement. It's not that like one party has um, special information that gives them an advantage in the trade so they get to trick somebody. Um, so I'll give you another really good example. So a classic example, there was a famous paper that was written back by a UCLA economist um, in, I think it was the 1980s. And his last name was Akerlof. And um, it was called The Lemons Problem. And he's talking about, I don't know if you guys have ever heard, but getting a used car that's a lemon. And the idea is that a lot of times um, used car markets wouldn't work well because um, a private party seller knows a lot about the quality of the vehicle. And, and because of that, what generally happens is that people who have a good car will want to keep it and people that have a bad car or a lemon will want to sell it. And so buyers in the market, they don't know anything about the history of the car. And so nowadays, some, some actual steps have been taken to correct this problem, you know, we have Carfax and, and there are some um, used car warranties that are available and those didn't used to be available, but as a result of this analysis, they're now available in the market. So you have to think between before Carfax and before, um, you know, used car warranties, which like I said, are both relatively recent um, innovations in the used car market. But back then, um, you know, a buyer, he could maybe inspect it, but you know, there are lots of problems that don't emerge right away and they don't necessarily know, um, you know, about the history of the car. So, so what that meant is there was an unusually low volume of used car transactions because everybody assumed that was out to buy a car that if they bought a used car, they were gonna buy a lemon. So um, that just made the problem worse because nobody would sell a, a good used car because they knew the good used car was worth more than the price that was prevailing in the market at the time under this information asymmetry, um, which was the lemon or the bad quality car price that was showing up in the market. So anyway, um, the point is that if I can, as a used car seller, can credibly demonstrate, and now you know through Carfax and warranty and stuff like that, that I know this is a good car, and the buyer knows it's a good car too. Our probability estimates are the same. It's not perfect. You know, anything could happen, but I'm not hiding some major problem. Then they can agree on uh, a price where neither party later on is, is surprised. Um, and so, so ultimately, um, what the symmetric information boils down to is both parties have the same information about the quality of the good being traded such that neither is surprised 
later um, about purchasing a good of lower quality than expected. So they both, uh, and I should say purchasing or selling a good of lower or higher quality than expected. So, you know, everybody's on board. Nobody's surprised. Um, no one is surprised and no one is tricked in a symmetric market, um, symmetric information market equilibrium. Okay. So, so those are all of our uh, conditions in order for competition to have the properties that the first fundamental welfare theorem says that it should have. So we actually have tackled the first part of the, the first fundamental welfare theorem um, pretty thoroughly. The, the next part that we want to talk about, and we talked about it a little bit, but there's a little bit more for us yet to say about efficiency. So um, that's where um, we'll end for today. And um, could you go?